Well, there is this article that I published back in 2003 presenting the simulation argument. This is an argument that tries to show that at least one of three propositions is true, although it doesn't tell us which of these three. The three propositions in question is first, that almost all civilizations at our stage of technological development go extinct before they reach technological maturity. So that's the first possibility. Uh, a second possibility is that there is a very strong convergence among all technologically mature civilizations in that they all lose interest in creating ancestor simulations, as I call them. This would be very detailed computer simulations of people like their historical forebears, detailed enough that the simulated people in these simulations would be conscious. So the second possibility is that they just lose interest in doing this. And the third possibility is that we are almost certainly living in a simulation. So there's this argument that shows that one of these three is true. And the full argument involves some probability theory, but the basic idea can be grasped quite simply, which is that suppose it were the case that the first possibility did not obtain. So then some non-trivial fraction of civilizations at our stage eventually reach technological maturity. Then suppose the second possibility also does not obtain. So some non-negligible fraction of those mature civilizations are still interested in using their resources to running ancestor simulations. You can then show that because each mature civilization that devoted some resources to this purpose could run astronomical numbers of ancestor simulations. You can show that if the first two possibilities do not obtain, then there will be many, many more simulated people like us than there will be non-simulated people like us. In other words, almost all people with our kinds of experiences would be living inside simulations rather than outside them if the first two possibilities are false. And the conditional on that, we should therefore think we are probably one of the typical simulated people rather than one of the exceptional non-simulated people. So the structure of the argument then is that if you reject the first two hypotheses, then the third one follows, which then means you can't coherently reject all three. That, that's the structure of the simulation argument. And there's a further possibility that if you have a simulated civilization, that that simulated civilization might, inside the simulation, develop the technology to run its own simulations. And you might then have a kind of nested simulation with simulation inside the simulation. You might have many levels of simulation. But that's an optional extra. It doesn't The basic simulation argument doesn't presuppose that. It's just that if you extrapolate the kind of computing power that an advanced civilization will eventually have, and you figure if they would use some of that immense computing power to running simulations, they could run an astronomical number of them. So therefore, in that scenario, most people with our kinds of experiences would be among the simulated people, because for each original history, there would then be maybe millions or, or, or billions of simulated histories. So if that were the case, we should believe the simulation hypothesis. But the simulation argument doesn't imply the simulation hypothesis. It just says that there are these three possibilities, one of which is true, leaving it open which one of them. It's also possible that we will all fail to reach this level of technological maturity, that all civilizations at our current stage of development go extinct for some other reason. Maybe there is some advanced technology such that when you discover it, you invariably use it to destroy yourself. Or there might be some other reason why, why civilizations will not get through to this level of technological maturity. But if they do, and if they're still interested in that stage that using some of their resources to producing these ancestor simulations, then most people like us would be living in these simulations. So the simulation argument imposes a constraint on what you can coherently believe about the future and about our place in the world. So it's different in this respect from these traditional arguments in philosophy that have challenged somebody to try to prove that prove that the external world exists or prove to me that uh, I'm not dreaming or something like that. Prove to me that I'm not in a that I'm not a brain in a vat just being fed sensor input through electrons. This is like a traditional discussion in philosophy, which 
it's a kind of an intellectual game to, to, to explore what we mean by knowledge and so forth. But the simulation argument is different from that in that it doesn't start from a position of doubt. It doesn't start by challenging somebody to prove beyond reasonable doubt that, that, that the external world really exists, that it's not just a dream. Rather, the simulation argument starts by assuming everything is as it seems. It starts by assuming that science tells us about the world, that we have computers in the external world, that those computers are getting faster and better with passing time. And then using that scientific picture to think about what kind of capabilities will eventually be available to a mature civilization. And then drawing out the implications of that. And then ending up in this position where we've got to recognize that one of these three propositions is true, and in particular the simulation hypothesis seems worth taking seriously. As I said, so the simulation argument shows that one of these three possibilities is true. Now, I don't think we have very strong evidence for or against either one of them. And therefore, we should maybe distribute our credence more or less evenly between them. We cannot rule out that there is this strong filter that prevents any civilization at our stage from reaching technological maturity. That seems consistent with what we know. We also can't rule out that there would be this strong convergence, like maybe all sufficiently advanced civilizations just lose interest in creating ancestor simulations. Now this, this would be a departure from the current situation where there certainly are many people in the world today who, if they could, would like to run these simulations of conscious being. I mean, we, we look at computer gaming, like the more realistic the, the, the simulated world is, the, the, the more appealing it is to the people playing the games. We have literature which tries to conjure up virtual worlds. We have maybe, if these simulations could be made more accurate, maybe historians would be interested in, in creating these to, to sort of study the past. There are many possible reasons why somebody might want to create an ancestor simulation if they could. Nevertheless, we can't rule out the possibility that once some civilization reaches a sufficient level of maturity, maybe they will lose interest in doing this. Maybe they'll realize that it would be horribly unethical, for example, to create simulated people who suffer if those, if those simulated people are conscious. Maybe there is some other reason. So, so the, the reason why I don't assign an overwhelming probability to the simulation hypothesis is that there are these two alternatives. So I believe that the simulation argument is sound, um, but that's consistent with thinking that there is less than 50% chance that the simulation hypothesis is true. Well, I had uh, sort of two strands of uh, research interest that converged in the simulation arguments. On the one hand, I had had a long-standing interest in the future implications of technology, just thinking about what, once we push closer to the physical limits, what kind of technological capabilities might humanity one day develop. On the other hand, I had also done my PhD uh, on developing a mathematical theory of observation selection effects. This is a piece of methodology that you need to reason about questions uh, that involve anthropic bias, so that reason about questions that involve indexical information, that's information about who you are, what time it is, where you are, that kind of locates an observer within a particular model. So I had done a lot of research on that. Now, once you have these two pieces of background, then the simulation argument is really just one inferential step away. Like once you combine thinking about where technology might lead with this kind of observation selection theory, then you just like one insight to kind of put these pieces together and, and you get the simulation argument popping out of that. And uh, it's significant because it, it imposes this su surprising constraint on what you can coherently believe about uh, the future and uh, our place in the world. Uh, so it might seem at first like anything could happen, how we, we have no evidence to kind of limit the range of possibilities. Uh, we don't know anything about what other civilizations, if there are any out there in the universe, how likely they are to survive, what they would want to do if they became technologically mature. Uh, we have no way of knowing whether they're in a simulation or not. There might be many other possibilities, but the simulation argument kind of constrains the space of possibilities in a surprising way. So aside from the possibility that we're in a simulation, it also helps inform us to some extent about 
the kinds of existential risk that we might confront in the future, like threats to the survival of Earth originating civilization. Um, so it's one of those clues we have that maybe together with other insights can, can help um, inform us about where we are in the world and what might, what might lie in our future. Well, the simulation argument does not presuppose that future people would be interested in running ancestor simulations. It's in fact, one of the three possibilities that are consistent with this argument is that there is a complete loss of interest in creating ancestor simulations. But note that this loss does not only have to happen in our own lineage, in, among our own descendants, but among all advanced technological civilizations throughout the universe, or almost all advanced civilization. There has to be this convergence that they all lose this interest in order to account for why it is that uh, we are not in a simulation if we are not. Yeah, so the idea, this concept of an ancestor simulation would be a very particular kind of computer simulation, unlike any we have today a computer simulation in which the simulated people are conscious. So that might require simulating these virtual people to a level where individual neurons in their brains would be included in the simulation. So if all you're simulating is a kind of two-dimensional little, little diagram, then obviously there is no conscious experience arising from that. But if you were simulating, say, a brain down to the level of individual neurons, then on many theories, that simulation itself could create consciousness. That what makes something conscious is not that it's built out of carbon atoms like we are inside the brain, but that it implements a certain kind of computation. Um, and, and so it is, if and when you have the ability to create simulations with that level of granularity, where you could simulate individual brains down to the level of individual neurons and and then have sentient people in those simulations, that's when you would create this possibility of running ancestor simulations. And that then is where the simulation argument becomes relevant. There's been a, a great deal of interest in it, um, which is understandable because it kind of does place this interesting constraint. Uh, on where we might be in the world. And in particular, it seems to force us to take very seriously the possibility that we are in a simulation, which is like a kind of very radical claim. And it's important to understand it's not that we are in, in a simulation in a metaphorical sense. It's not that we could sort of think of the universe as if it were a digital computation or a cellular automata that that kind of, it's that, in, that it would be a simulation in the literal sense and that there would be some some very intelligent individuals in some advanced civilization that would build a computer and then run some program on that computer and we would be patterns inside that program. Um, so it's a striking, it, it has a kind of implications for these striking hypotheses. So it, it, it's, it's not surprising that, that it has uh, attracted a fair amount of attention, I think. Um, it seems to be coming in, in waves that um, like every every, uh, every year or every other year or so, there is a kind of, I guess, a read like a, a new set of people come across this for the first time. And there's like this wave of, uh, of media attention. Um, and uh, at the same time, a kind of gradual accumulation of scholarly research on this. So there have been a number of follow up papers and so forth that that are coming out. Yeah, the most common misunderstanding is to conflate the simulation hypothesis with the simulation argument. The simulation hypothesis is the statement that we are living in a computer simulation. I think that is less than 50% likely to be the case. However, I do believe in the simulation argument, which shows or purports to show that one of three propositions is true one of which is the simulation hypothesis. But then there are these other two propositions as well that also are alternatives. The possibility that almost all civilizations go extinct before reaching technological maturity and 
the possibility that there is this strong convergence among all technologically mature civilizations such that they all lose interest in creating ancestor simulations. Um, and it, it's hard it's hard to for people to keep those two ideas apart. Uh, I think there is a kind of um, complexity limit in, in, in a lot of media communication that it's easy enough to convey kind of one idea and in, in more highbrow media you might convey an idea that has two parts like on the one hand this and on the other hand that but the simulation argument kind of has three components and it just seems to exceed the communication bandwidth it just gets a little bit too complex for popular media sometimes but it's it's a little bit complex but it's really not more complex than most like educated people could probably get their heads around if they thought about it for half an hour or an hour kind of if they actually tried it, it doesn't require a phd to get your head i mean it, it, it is a little bit of complexity there but it's just a little bit too much to fit in normally in, in a sort of five minute interview setting well i get every once in a while uh, emails from various people who claim to have seen some anomaly that they claim proved to me that we are in a simulation. However, I don't credit these reports because if we are not in a simulation, you would expect a certain number of people to believe themselves to have spotted weird things like there's one guy, I don't know, he claimed to see pixels in the bathroom mirror or something like that. But we know from psychology and from paranormal phenomena that there are just these some people will have hallucinations, some people will re misremember what they've seen, some people will report erroneously. And I think that's true whether we are in a simulation or not. So even if we are in a simulation, I think that these kinds of reports are much more likely to be due to these normal psychological factors than they are to anybody actually observing a glitch in the simulation. To run a simulation at all would require some extremely advanced technology. Presumably the people doing this would be some kind of super intelligent post-human life forms, not thinkers like us. And I think that if they had the ability to create a simulation like this at all, they would also have the ability to paper over any cracks, any glitches that, that we might be able to detect. Or if we did detect something that they didn't want us to detect, then they could erase the memory or rewind the simulation and, and redo it. Yeah, so it's possible that the simulators might make a mistake, but they would also be in an extremely strong position to cover that mistake up from the people in the simulation. They would presumably be super intelligent and easily able to outsmart us. They have complete control over the whole structure of reality. And if you're running the simulation, you could even in principle go in and edit the brain states of people inside the simulation. You could erase the memories, you could rewind the simulation. There would be any number of tools to avoid a kind of glitch from ruining the simulation. If if they wanted to do that. There, there would conversely be many ways in which they could let us know that we were in a simulation if they wanted to do that. It could be a big window popping up in front of you, like informing you, you are in a simulation. Like, so it's a hypothesis that certainly there are possible observations, which if we made them would count say heavily in favor of being in a simulation. And therefore there are observations that would count against it as well. Uh, but one way to get some at least weak probabilistic evidence for or against the simulation hypothesis is via the simulation argument itself. So if you remember, the argument tries to show one of these three propositions is true. So that means that any evidence that we have that makes the other two alternatives less likely would have to make the simulation hypothesis more likely. So for instance, if we discovered strong evidence that there is some very great filter that would tend to make it impossible for any civilization to reach technological maturity that would tend to reduce the probability of the simulation hypothesis. Um, now, one situation in which we would get very strong evidence that we are in a simulation is if we ourselves or our descendants one day reach technological maturity and actually develop the technology to create their own ancestor simulations. Imagine that they built this massive computer sometime in the future, set it all up so that it will implement an ancestor simulation and they are about to flick the on switch. Well, at that stage, they could pretty much rule out the 
other two alternative hypotheses, right? Because they knew that if they had made it through to technological maturity, that would be strong evidence against the first possibility. It would show that not almost all civilizations go extinct before becoming technologically mature. And if they are still interested in creating ancestor simulations, that would rule out the second possibility. It's not the case then that almost all technologically mature civilizations have lost interest. If you are a technologically mature civilization and you are interested, that's strong evidence against the second possibility. And that would then only leave them with a third possibility, that they are in a simulation. So if and when we got to that stage, we would have very strong reason to infer that we ourselves are simulated. Well, so another major research uh, focus here uh, in my research group is uh, studying existential risks. So an existential risk is one that would either imperil the survival of uh, Earth originating intelligent life, like a risk that could cause our extinction, or that could permanently and drastically destroy our future, our future potential for desirable development. So an existential catastrophe is one in the sense that would destroy our entire future. So there's never been an existential catastrophe. I mean, we are still here. And they pose a unique set of challenges to us, precisely because we have very limited opportunity to learn from experience. We've got to be proactive with regard to these risks. Um, we're all in the same boat when it comes to existential risks. And the values uh, that are online are, are extremely large. Uh, so if one asks what kind of risks are there that raise to this level of existential risk, I would say that all the really big existential risks are ones that arise in one way or another out of human activity. And there's an easy way to see that, which is that our human species has lived on this planet for more than 100,000 years, surviving all kinds of threats from nature. We have survived earthquakes and volcano eruptions and asteroid impacts and fire storms and everything. So it's unlikely that any of those would do us in within the next 100 years if they have, haven't done us in within the previous 100,000 years. By contrast, we are introducing completely new types of hazards into the world through our own activities. And more specifically, I think that all the really big existential risks are related to anticipated future technological breakthroughs. For example, in synthetic biology or in advanced forms of molecular nanotechnology or in machine intelligence, artificial intelligence. I think those are some of the areas where in the future uh, there might be major existential risks.